like coming to this um, yeah, bi-weekly or yeah, part of the coconut meeting. Um, I'm Edwin, I think I just know all the kids. And yeah, I'm from the neurology department with two students. I'm Julian, I'm a guest here. I'm from the Max Planck Institute of Polar Research in Mülheim an der Ruhr, so I'm in the Ruhr Gebiet. I'd like to be here. This institute is way nicer than mine. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was always here, but yes. <laughs> okay, and actually, um, I just to give you a little bit of the background, um, I sent this paper, um, I found it by accident, kind of. I sent it to Simon and among the group, and he said, oh, wow, why don't you present it in the coaching meeting? So, okay, good, but at least I'm supporting. So we cleaned up, and we will bring to you um, this paper that has now actually been also published in Entropy um, by yeah, Kate Jeffries, um, Robert Pollack, and Carlo Rossetti. And um, actually, they are um, yeah, uh, they teamed up as a neuroscientist, as a physicist, and um, a biologist. Yeah, contemplating a little bit about Schrödinger and what this brings about. We will kind of bring to you today. Um, so the outline will be, um, we will give you um, an intro or um, yeah, shuffle through a little bit the, um, the, through the concept of entropy so that we're all on the same uh, understanding um, of the concept. Um, then we will briefly or yeah, kind of briefly um, go through the paper a little bit at least. <laughs> um, yeah. And then we will also have a little bit of a part um, what also the paper already starts to discuss, but we will somehow develop it a little bit more. Um, what are then the implications for humanity? Um, what do we learn from this? What does it mean for us? And why are we actually here and what can we do? Mm -hmm. All right. So let's start with the <coughs> art science part, entropy. What is entropy? We found this nice picture on 9gag. Entropy is why you can't unbreak an egg. I would argue it's just partially right, because basically it would not be entropy itself, but the second law of thermodynamics, which we will talk about later. Um, but some people argue that this process um, is the reason why uh, the universe only has one direction, why time only goes forward and not backward. Um, hopefully, at the end of this talk, you will understand why. So uh, moving on, yeah. Um, Talking about the concept of entropy, I think we do not get around Ludwig Boltzmann. Um, this is his um, tombstone, and the very, uh, yeah, uh, what, what really stands out here is um, that <laughs> <laughs> you can see that he has this uh, equation on his tombstone actually, S equals K log W. Nowadays, we would, uh, rather write it like this. So what we say, um, based on Ludwig Boltzmann, is that the entropy can be described at the, um, Boltz as the Boltzmann constant um, multiplied with the natural logarithm of the number of microstates. OK, we have an equation, some things. What does this mean, actually? I think a nice way to put this um, is that entropy is related to the amount of additional information that is needed to specify the exact physical state or what we call the microstate of a system um, for which we know the macrostate or the macroscopic specification. So let's try to make this plastic. This is Waldo. Hi, Waldo. <laughs> Waldo is a nice example to show us what entropy actually is about. So in our case, um, the macrostate we talk about is one Waldo at the defined position among n persons. The microstate we talk about is a person's Waldo-ness. Kind of. In this case, it's pretty simple because n equals one. There's only one person in this picture. And we can definitely say this: the Waldo-ness of this one person equals one. So this picture has a quite low entropy on this Waldo-ness scale. But if we look at this picture, um, we have one macrostate, again, one person with a Waldo-ness equals one, <laughs> so one Waldo, 
among all these n persons and what we can see here so every person in principle could be Waldo so we need to find the exact microstate that describes our Waldo what we have we have many people with a Waldo ness of pretty much zero we have a few examples like this one or this one with the Waldo ness slightly above zero because of these red, uh, red and white stripes but it's still close to zero and the only um, this is the position where Waldo Ness equals one. Kind of. So this information, this red circle with a green background, is kind of the information I gave you now, the level of entropy that is needed to define the exact microstate of this macrostate. So I think you understood, right? In principle, every, every person on this picture could be Waldo, but it's only one and it's found there. So this is our microstate that's defining this macrostate. So this is an example as opposed to the other one that has a quite high entropy. Um, this is another example. I heard you all got an email yesterday um, regarding your uh, lab space or office spaces. This is a quite plastic example to describe what entropy is about. So you all know when we just leave things as they will come, as they will happen, um, we'll all find a desk looking like this. So if we would define the mi microstate or the macrostate as the desk, and the microstate is finding a certain thing at a certain point, in this case a lot of information is needed because it could be principally everywhere. So the entropy is quite high. When we put a lot of energy in it, by hydrolyzing ATP, basically, we will eventually maybe land here where everything has its defined spot. So we know by default where things are. So we don't know, uh, we don't need much information in order to understand, uh, in, in order to describe the microstate of this macrostate. Yeah. Um, this is also a nice example to show that. Um, entropy is often correlated with this order or described as this order. This is a kind of oversimplification as we will see uh, later through this talk, um, but in general it's a, it's a quite nice uh, conjunction to make. So in most cases higher disorder means higher entropy because we need more information to describe the exact microstate of our given macro. Coming to the second law of thermodynamics, it's not only about entropy, it's about the direction of entropy. So the second law of thermodynamics is not an equation, it's more like a statement, it's more like a thing, a, a way things happen. So there are many, many ways to put it, and my favorite one um, is from Max Planck, from the end of the 19th century, where he says that every process that is occurring in nature um, needs to increase the sum of its, of its entropies. So whatever happens everywhere, everything that happens increases the overall entropy. When we have processes that reduce the entropy, like tidying up my desk, I need another process that's releasing more or generating more entropy than is um, con consumed by the process of tidying my desk, like hydrolyzing ATP by muscle work. Um, ATP is generally the, the um, yeah, I mean, you all know this, right? It's the, kind of the uh, money for the body, uh, for the, the energy. Um, and it's most, in, in many cases, ATP is just hydrolyzed by en enzymatic um, reactions to actually account for the second law of thermodynamics. So when we have a process that goes uphill energetically or, en or entropically, um, many enzymes hydrolyze ATP aside just to account for this, just to make sure that it's favored by, um, by nature. This leaves us with one problem because now we kind of need to quantify entropy, right? 
when we say entropy needs to increase, we kind of need a number for this. This is just a problem for us now because we came from the other side around. Entropy itself, fortunately, was defined in 1854 as exactly this. So, um, Rudolf Clausius uh, defined entropy, he, he came up with the concept of entropy kind of as a surrogate for heat. He found out that heat, the energy of heat has a different value in, at different temperatures. So if I have a heat of 20 Joule, for example, it makes a difference if I have this heat of 20 Joule at 2000 Kelvin or at 20 Kelvin. It's not the same. So he, he made up this, this simple equation and said, okay, then let's not talk about the heat, but about the entropy. We have to be cautious because this is just based on mathematics. So this is not based really on laboratory results. These were like people like um, Clausius, like um, Planck, like Carnot, who just sat there and thought about the, the processes, the concepts, and calculated them through. And this is how entropy was formed. It was not measured, it was calculated. So it's kind of difficult to find a physical analogy um, or to, to understand this in, in practical terms. So this equation yeah, tells us these two things. Number one, it's kind of related to heat and it's more like a construct in our head. So it's not really existing. It's more like a surrogate, more like more like a, a picture for ourselves to understand why things happen the way they happen. Um, so let's just assume entropy equals heat for now to oversimplify. This leaves us with two kinds of reactions. Reactions where energy is released in form of heat normally <coughs> and reactions where energy is absorbed. This um, is called an exothermic or an endothermic reaction. And based on the second law of thermodynamics, which we just saw, we would assume now that nature only follows processes that are exothermic, right? Only processes where heat is generated. Um, in praxis, it shows though that this is not always the case. There are examples like, for example, dissolving salts in water, certain salts like sodium chloride or ammonium nitrate or potassium chlorate, um, which absorb energy. And still they happen. Still, even though, like, I mean, everybody who has had chemistry in, a, in, in school in, I don't know, 11th, 12th grade will probably have made this experiment to take ice, put salt on it, and see how the temperature drops up to minus 18 degrees. So this is a process that is happening in nature spontaneously, yet it's absorbing energy. So it's an endothermic process still happening. Um, we can understand this if we look at the molecular level, because when we take a grain of salt and know its exact position, we by default know the exact position of all of the ions, because they are in this very rigid, lattice um, and they don't they can't move they can't mingle as soon as we know where the grain of salt is we have all the information that is needed well if we know which chemical <laughs> substance we have but then we have all the information needed to define the exact position and if we now start dissolving this we will eventually come to a point where we do not only not know where the uh, where the particles the ions are but it's also starting to become a dynamic process. So every second, every millisecond, we would need to define it nearly. So even though the, the whole enthalpy, so the, the overall thermicity of the process is negative, it absorbs energy, it's still entropically favored because we will generate kind of a certain kind of disorder. Um, so, coming back to our graphs, it seems that this is not all the information we need. So, this, this concept of heat, um, we will call for now enthalpy. So, enthalpy is kind of the measurement of heat. 
basically this difference. Um, but now we know this is not only the, the, the only thing is that's, that we have to deal with when we talk about entropy. So what we define now is also the Gibbs energy through this very famous gibbs hamels equation, um, which states that our overall Gibbs energy equals the enthalpy, so the heat, the oversimplified heat part of the entropy minus the real overall entropy, all the other parts of entropy that are neglected if we just care about the heat. Um, so instead of talking about exothermal and endothermal, we now talk about exergon and energon. So an exergonic process is a process that generates Gibbs energy, where the Gibbs energy is negative, and hence this process will happen in nature, no matter if it absorbs energy or not. So we don't care about the enthalpy anymore in order to describe if a process happens or not. We care about the Gibbs energy. If the Gibbs energy is negative, processes happen spontaneously. If, if the Gibbs energy is positive, they will not, no matter if the reaction is exothermal or endothermal. So this is, coming back to the second law of thermodynamics, this is how I would put it. Every spontaneously proce proceeding process occurring in nature needs to be exergonic. If we have a reversible process in an equilibrium, um, this means delta G is zero, so that's kind of a limit. It does not necessarily need to generate Gibbs energy, but it must not consume Gibbs energy. So it can stay equal, but it, in the best case, to, to have an irreversible reaction, Gibbs energy is um, produced. Yeah, so coming back to this, um, to this uh, oversimplification, as I, uh, as I called it, that entropy kind of is related to disorder. Um, this is true in many, many processes. So generally, one can say that disorder is an entrop entropically favorable process. Whenever disorder is generated, this increases the entropy. But we learned that there are many, many ways entropy can be increased by heat, by disorder, by many other things. One very beautiful example are, for example, snowflakes. They're highly ordered, as you can see here. Um, and this is because the, when, the, when the water molecules, when they freeze, when they assemble in this ordered manner, um, this hydrogen bonding that occurs there um, generates more entropy than the disorder if we just made them randomly. So it's always a trade-off, right? It's not, not always entropy equals disorder, and we try to maximize disorder, and that's the end of the story. But it's, we always have to account for the many different entropically favorable processes in order to understand what's the most entropically favorable process. And generally, we, I already um, introduced this idea of ma microstate and macrostate. Generally, one can say that um, Entropy on a micro scale is generally more, like in, in quantity, more than the entropy on a macro scale. So if I have a macro scale that is highly ordered, um, that is implying a highly disordered micro scale, it will be favored over the other way. Because in a micro scale, we have way more degrees of freedom. If you, for example, compare one snowflake to the millions, billions of water molecules they consist of, and this little bit of order on the macro scale here um, is negligible compared to the to the amount of energy that is um, that we that, that we generate by putting them in order and generating this this hydrogen bond. Um, so now leaving the realm of uh, general introduction, <laughs> starting to discuss about the paper, which we actually want to introduce here. I'll give you a few more examples where order is the entropically favored variance from the paper. Like the snowflakes, which we already discussed based on the hydrogen bonding. Another examples are bouncing balls. So if I took a 
um, <coughs> a bag or something where I have bouncing balls inside, which are just randomly bouncing around, eventually they will all come to the ground. Right? They will all lay on the ground eventually. This is because the gravity is stronger than the entropy that's generated by the disorder when they just bounce around. Also, heat is produced when they, when they meet each other, and this also is more entropically favored than the disorder on the macro scale. Another example is phase separation. If we try to mix, for example, water with oil, um, we can, again, think of this lattice structure of the salt we just saw, where we have molecule, uh, the, the ions just altering, like plus minus, plus minus, we can also think about this with water and oil. The water molecule is an oil molecule, water molecule is an oil molecule. And if they are like completely disordered, they cannot move. Because water and oil, they repel each other. So when, we, when the phases are separated, we have the oil layer and the water layer, they can mingle among each other. So the water molecule will be highly disordered and the oil molecule will be highly disordered on the micro scale. So the ordering on the macro scale by separating the phases generates more disorder on the micro scale, which is entropically favored. Another example from the paper <laughs> to show this, where this, how this uh, micro macro scale is also really relative is if we compare the water in the oceans with the air, so the gas of the air. If we just talked about disorder, we would assume, we would um, think that the water and the air just will mingle all the time, will mix. But this does not happen, as we know. We have oceans, we have an atmosphere, and this is because when the phases separate, as I explained, things will, among themselves, mix better, so the disorder in the separate phases is higher. And the last example for this, um, going even one scale up, the formation of galaxies and stars. Um, also driven by the force of gravity, um, as far as we know. Um, that, uh, you know those examples, it's also a kind of example, that the phase separation is sure, water and water mix, but the thing is that only. Yeah, right. There's a question, there's, there's a question about the intramolecular forces. Yeah. If they are attractive or yeah. reactive. Like sure, if we mix water with wine, for example, or yeah. water, water with ethanol or glycerin or something, they will mix because if we if we yeah. put them next to each other, they can they can exchange. Yeah, so exactly. So it's if it's a question of intermolecular force, what why go to the entropy of this as an explanation that only works for some cases? Um, yeah. Yeah, right. It definitely, I mean, this is the same for, for, for all the others, right? It, it depends on the specific setting. Um, I mean, yeah, this, is, this does not say that order on a mac macro scale always entropically, is always entropically favored. It just says that there are examples that contradict this notion that entropy equals disorder. Oh. So that there are processes where high order is actually entropically favored. Oh. And this is pretty much um, where my part of the talk ends, because now Evelyn will talk about the more specific example where the uh, order is entropically favored. Thank you. So my very specific um, example, um, now we're entering a little bit more the realm of biology, I guess. And um, we're talking about life. Uh, a <laughs> very specific example. Um, and the main, so if you were to take one message home today, I think this would be it. So from the paper, um, I think the main um, yeah, part would be um, that the authors claim that life is an actual, uh, actually is an entropically favored phenomenon. And this, um, so as an neurologist, um, you would also always consider um, anything from the very um, small scale, um, starting probably from the DNA, um, or DNA molecules um, up to yeah, planets, or in this case, um, planet Earth. Um, and with this, um, this is also a little bit where the title from the paper comes from. Um, so 
this statement somehow goes um, against um, some, a little bit of a, I don't want to call it a random statement by Schrodinger, but it's probably not his main um, yeah, research focus, of course, but he once said that um, life would be as an, as an improbable fight against entropy. But actually this paper somehow, um, and we will go through this, um, again makes the claim that it's actually the other way around. So um, from the paper we have this um, illustration um, to somehow visualize this concept. And so we have different states. If you have here um, the low entropy state and the high entropy state, so L is nested within H in a way. And L, which could be assumed as a current state, so in time, so to say, in current state. Um, but the thing is that L will always end up in the larger space of H. But the inverse is not possible, so H won't end up in L. Um, and so the system is limited in its ability to explore the entire phase space um, because L, for example, is always trapped um, in its own bubble, so to say. And what's important here to notice, L, um, there's a boundary kind of around L, but it's a boundary that can be surpassed, um, and that is uh, normally typically happening through random motion, so to say. So by random exploration, um, the current state of L can somehow um, yeah, touch the boundaries of it, and maybe at a random point of um, ran with random motion, we'll find a channel on how to get then through this boundary into H. If we look at uh, an increase in complexity, and so all of these bubbles actually, first thing to say, um, are all um, kind of those bubbles that we had before on the slide. Yeah? So those are different states and they're connected with those little bars, which are those channels. So channels um, which can be opened through random motion um, or any random effect. And what is important here to notice is that the size of the bubbles do increase with increasing complexity and also increase or even this is also then correlated with an increase of entropy. So, so yes? I mean, when you say complexity here, what, what does that mean? Um, I think, from my understanding, uh, it means an increase of order. Um, okay. Or how but can Basically, I would say it's an increase of, well, it's, it's pretty much, should be pretty much um, correlated to the entropy because an increase of complexity means that we have more microstates um, defining the same macrostate. That's also why the bubbles get bigger with bigger complexity. Um, because if, if we have a room filled with 50 persons, it's more, more complex to describe where, who is sitting where than if we have a room filled with three people. Right? Pretty much, yeah. It's it's kind of correlated. It's not always the same because we learned that entropy is not only about order and disorder. Um, there are many many f ways, but that's why you can see here that when we when the complexity increases and the entropy, the bubbles also increase, right? Because this is pretty much when the bubble increases, we have more microstates defining the same macrostate, which is based on the Boltzmann equation, pretty much the same as entropy. So maybe to make it, um, or to look at this whole concept from a different angle, um, again, and this is also mentioned in the paper, um, there was a comparison to um, dynamic systems and attractive states. And what this typically refers to is that there is some kind, so state one um, is in, um, or state two actually is in a metastable stable state, coming from one, and the attractive state would then be three, so a state that is um, higher or more probable um, to occur and then stability is higher. And um, one kind of uh, more practical example still from biology, I would say, um, was actually um, yeah, um, depicted here uh, in a quite famous PNAS paper. Um, and what you can see here basically is that um, through time, so that's um, depicted, so that's <coughs> somehow the attractive state for planet Earth. So which state um, is most likely that planet Earth will end up in. And if we come back, or if we look back into time, um, Earth somehow developed 
or has the tendency to uh, end up in a heat attractive state on the right that you see in the picture here uh, in a red color with the hot temperature and a cold temperature as opposed to the left side. Um, and the question now is, um, yeah, with a rise in the Anthropocene, um, which state is most likely um, where planet Earth will end up in. Well, from this graph, you can clearly see most likely would be a scenario on the far right, um, right um, that we end up in the hothouse Earth scenario. However, there is also some probability that we can reach the stabilized Earth meta stable state in the middle. However, the implication here from the paper is that this won't um, be the most probable state as of now, but there sh would be some action needed actually force somehow or to work against this dynamic system against the attractive state. And another example, and I'm very glad um, Jakob you're here, um, that was also mentioned in the paper were plate cells um, as of those attractor dynamics um, and they introduced in such a way that um, normally, um, I don't know whether this is um, the, the best homage I can give to your paper, but um, the idea was that when we have um, small or no environmental changes, actually the plate cells just follow their habitual firing pattern. However, if there is a big shift in the environment, then they would actually also adapt and yeah, somehow um, reorganize their firing pattern with the different methods which would be more suitable and hence end up at the attractive state. If we now go again into the realm of life, um, probably know that DNA is somehow the binding molecule between not only us as humans but between all species. Um, so um, we know that um, DNA or um, yeah in itself um, is kind of stable um, there is a kind of meta stability in it here as well especially if we look at it in terms of some bigger time scales yeah billions of years there has always been DNA and it's somehow the carrier of information throughout all of those years. However, there's also some small fluctuations on the DNA level. Um, for example, um, yeah, present or um, yeah, um, as DNA mutations, but also as um, recombinatoric when we consider sexual reproduction. And this is a central um, process of biology to uh, ensure that there is some randomness also, that, that there is this random motion also on the DNA level so that we can ensure that it's not only stable but that it's actually metastable and that we have the chance to explore in a random fashion new avenues um, of this kind of information. And so that's very important. Those fluctuations, as I just said, are not, not accidental but they're actually the core function why life is uh, possible. And this is, of course, also not a new concept. That's basically uh, what Darwin just started with on the origin of species um, by the natural selection. And um, what this paper here, again, um, puts into the um, yeah, core of the discussion is that DNA is really uh, considered as an information carrier across time. So it somehow surpasses the limits of an individual organism um, because of mortality, yeah, and as life metabolism is limited, however DNA um, is not. Um, so um, what makes it so special as a preservation medium, there are three uh, levels of this information um, structuring. That's first the structure of the double helix, so one strand is always the template for the other one, um, which makes it somehow self-sustaining. Um, then it's uh, encoding protein, so there's again a connection to another scale of life, if you want to say so. And then, of course, um, that it has a high temporal correlation to the past and the future. And um, there is another quote by Francis Crick here, um, which was also mentioned in the paper, and I find it very um, yeah, um, <laughs> nice. So all life, sir, is DNA's way of making more DNA. So really breaking down actually any biological process to DNA replication. Um, yeah, and with this, um, the question now again comes um, if DNA really surpasses all these temporal correlations in time and is a strong um, yeah, predictor of our life, um, how do we then, as humans, um, what is our role in this whole game? 
So um, what is quite important um, for humans or organizations, so um, noteworthy maybe in our own opinion, uh, in a biological way <coughs> is that um, actually, as you all know, is that we have somehow developed this very condensed um, features or skills of the cognitive representational um, cap capability. And so we are very um, yeah, skilled to surpass um, or to create new correlations across time and space. So for example, we are able um, to look very far um, into the future, but also back to the past. So if we can a little bit, maybe like DNA molecules, we can um, expand a little bit our sense of time in that kind of sense. Um, so, which leads us um, to having the skill as a um, species to exponentially accumulate and exchange information um, and to increase thereby complexity. Um, and this means, or this somehow goes along the lines, that we uh, can also um, somehow foster a heavy coupling between those different scales. Um, and this is very important because we therefore um, are able to shorten um, the pace of change. So we are able to create more change in a um, smaller time. And if we look at one example, so for example, we as humans, there are a couple of humans around, and every person has a new idea, for example, at least once an hour. Um, if we compare this to DNA mutation rates, um, this actually then leaves us with, uh, leaves us, um, with novel idea um, 10 to the power of five times more frequently like um, compared to the DNA mutation rate. So there's actually, again, um, yeah, a very exponential um, rate of novelty in the mental world. Um, yeah, induced by us humans. Um, and so the question is, if we have this very um, fast novelty rate, um, we cannot really compare it with anything else that has happened here so far, and well, on this planet, but also in the universe. So is humanity actually just an experiment by nature? Um, sorry, keep getting back, yes. <laughs> So uh, the question is a little bit, again, of those attackers say, so where would this experiment actually then um, um, yeah, go to, or what will it turn out to be in the end? Is it actually that we're going to this, att this attractive state, leaving us um, ourselves um, as uh, leading to a collapse, uh, leading to a mass extinction, or an extinction of our own? Um, or will we actually be able to go the other way um, and sustain our own lives um, and live in the future. And that um, was discussed in the paper as a very open discussion and a very open um, yeah, kind of question that needs to be addressed um, by humanity as itself. Even more so because we're able to actually think about and reflect upon it and also eventually act upon it. And so the question is uh, if humanity is just um, an experiment on planet Earth, well, what about other intelligent life forms on other planets, for example? Um, why or why have we up to now not been able yet to um, find any of those? And um, what the authors um, say, um, well, they give some reasons and then maybe they also um, say, well, maybe if uh, this very dense kind of intelligent form of life um, is actually biologically this unstable that they cannot sustain a certain amount of periods, so it would always eventually collapse. And our time um, that we are here now on planet Earth is just too narrow to actually see any kind of um, yeah, form of life anywhere else. And the other intelligent forms of life have the same problem kind of. So intelligent forms of life, complex, high entropic ones, would always lead to collapse eventually. And so what does this now all mean? And what is the conclusion of the paper? Well, first of all, <laughs> uh, it's an invitation, an open call to think about these concepts and to think a little bit um, about what does this mean for us and for the major stability or stability or instability for human existence. Um, specifically, they address the scientific community um, that we should 
somehow come together and reflect upon these things and um, yeah, um, actually start together to worry about this uncertainty of our own future. Um, and most importantly, they say, well, if this is the state um, of the affair, then it's very important actually to get rid of all those, let's say, different micro um, states, but to actually think on a more macroscopic um, scale and to think together, not on the individual levels, but actually to um, yeah, come together over some political and individual boundaries and interests and so on to actually think about the bigger problem, which is maximizing entropy on planet Earth. And <laughs> so, um, to not be too uh, yeah, grim and depressed, maybe, um, there are things to do. And um, I mean, the call is obviously open, and we don't really know um, where this ball Earth will end up, either on the left or on the right. Um, probability gives us some hints, but still, um, there are some things that you could do. There are I mean, those climate talks, the COP uh, conferences, conferences where you actually where you have the chance as a scientist to also um, go to and to contribute uh, in the discussions and the negotiations. Um, there are different organizations, and I won't all go into them. Um, but specifically, there's also an invitation for our sustainability network meeting in May here. Um, but what is then the whole aim? I mean, this is not all fun and jokes, but to bring it back to the concept, um, it's actually all of those suggestions, whether they are good or bad, I mean, they're just another um, try to actually find a way to get the channel to a, a new and a bigger um, safe space of life. If we think back of this L and H picture, we actually want to end up, uh, we don't want to end up in the collapse of L, but we actually want to reach the higher entropic state, which is so important. And I think that's actually it, yes? Um, yeah. So we also have some stuff, I mean, the pithy stuff, so... Other questions? Yes. First of all, we had some questions during the talk. Is this answered, or is this still...? Yeah. So, um, I mean, is knowledge, like, increasing, like, science increasing knowledge, is it then increasing the entropy overall? Right. Or is it not? Or is it leading to a failure? So I did not quite get the link. Um, that I mean, that intelligence mm -hmm. produces entropy, right? That was the mm -hmm. point. The, the the more intelligent uh, uh, a being, like let's say a human being, the more entropy it produces. Mm -hmm. But then, if you produce more knowledge, like with the science, that could also lead to an entropy decrease, right? And that would be yes. What would it be favorable then for the? Uh, um, for the so I think um, if I get it correctly, so I don't think that. The Um, but it's just some other question, um, are we able to get out of the current state into a, a larger um, entropic space, which is somehow, yeah, with bigger boundaries, yeah? So um, this doesn't mean that a high entropic state is always bad. Um, it's natural. That's exactly. what's happening I mean, it's all anyway, the time. Right? So we cannot even... But based on yeah. that, like, on what you presented, mm -hmm. one would argue that we should try to minimize I don't think so. I don't think we really can minimize entropy because the, that's what's like the, 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 the increase of entropy. But I'm confused because in the graph with the two uh, diagram that, that we are in the current state of low entropy rather than high entropy. And it wasn't the graph with just with two two around like a, a state L and a state ah, one, H yes. and then it says the current state yeah. is the low entropy and that I mean it says the channel to the new and larger region of this this mm -hmm. great space. I mean if we are already in the low entropy space so then we just automatically naturally move on to the yeah. larger space. So low and high entropy is always relative, right? Yeah. It's always low entropy compared to what? And if we, uh, you, you refer to this yeah. picture, right? Yeah. So uh, this is a very oversimplified way to put it <coughs> because in this case, there's only one high entropy state this low entropy state can get to. However, if we go one further, which is still extremely oversimplified, but has 
one element of complexity more, which is that we can, from one lower entropy state, can go to many different higher entropy states. Um, this is basically what it, what it goes down to. Yes, of course, we can just let, let things happen and eventually increase entropy. But what we can do, actually, is actively channel, since we are able to, to, to increase the amount, like, by, by our willpower, by our knowledge, by our thoughts, are able to direct, to steer in which direction we actually go towards the boundary, we can determine if we go into this bubble or that bubble or that bubble. And there are, as we then thought, as, as saw in the next picture, there are some, some bubbles that are more better for us and some bubbles that are worse for us. So I think the, the yes, we could just do nothing and eventually also this, for the, for the universe it doesn't matter, right? I was just about to say, so I mean, we also need to somehow see on which scales are we talking. So, for example, the picture before, I mean, the picture applies for humanity and itself as one species. Um, and then we could, for example, say, well, uh, let's not do science anymore because it actually uh, increases entropy. Um, but the problem is, anyway, in the other realm of life. Yeah, I'm sorry, why, why does knowledge increase entropy? What's, what's the connection there? Information. Information, yeah, but so. Informa but information in the sense of entropy is just randomness. The more I know about something, the less uh, the less information it contains, right? Yeah. So that's Heisenberg I mean also said the first sip of the glass of science makes me an atheist, and on the bottom of the glass, God is waiting. So basically, as as you know, for every every answer you get, you get at least two more questions. So by by sure. going no, no, the questions were there to begin with. In the sense, if I just if I just tell you, I'm going to write a book, and it's going to be about math. I can write a book and then you'll know something about it. If I just tell you I'm just going to write random stuff, there's less knowledge in it and there's more information. There's more information. There's more randomness. That's what entropy is. I mean, you would not be able to predict anything about that book that I wrote, that I just scramble things around. If I just tell you that I'm just going to scramble things around, you're not going to be able to tell me whether, you know, a set of letters is going to be there, whether a certain picture is going to go black or white. But if I tell you that I wrote something with intent, with knowledge, you know something about it. But uh, so I think so, uh, information I mean, is not completely random. Well, but that's the thing. That's, I mean, but that's the same with the DNA, for example. So one or even the snowflake or whichever one of the examples you take. So with the DNA, it's quite easy to understand. Because if there are the two W's, you see the two C's, yeah. whatever, in one theory. OK? Um, and then the nice thing about it is it's, it's symmetry or um, that the copies and all of them have that. So the interesting thing about it is that the information, even though if you would cut it in half, is still there. Same for the snowflake. So from half of the uh, content that you get, you already can predict the other part. Mm -hmm. And this is different if you have a high structure, for example, compared to your random book that you would just write. So you do not, you cannot predict any of the I other cases. That's right? basically true. The thing is that the double helix with its nice structure has lower entropy than if I just put the molecules randomly. Yes, yes, the, yes, though the information that is in there, it's, information is, is also very relative, right? Because sure. you can write the math book, yeah. and you can write the random assembly of letters, but if you write the math book in Klingonian, for example, it's the same for me, because I don't speak Klingonian. Sure. So there's no difference then in this book, right? So it's, you, can't really, you can't really say that this, for me, from my perspective, there's no difference. From your perspective, there is because you speak Klingonian. So, but that's the thing. So, entropy is a physical quantity, right? It just relates with the number of possible states, and that's it. Like, or a, let's say, or a mathematical abstractions of a physical reality to begin with. Now, now you're saying that it depends on the perspective. Well, then we're talking about different things. Because there's a physical, like the Boltzmann H theorem and all this stuff, like, there's something which is deeply mathematical in it, and that is a, a certain truth. Yeah, but and it's just, just the hypothetical. The Ma mathematics is just hypothetical. No, it's, I mean, it has, I mean, mathematics is true given a certain axiom. Yes. Whether that relates to the world is not a matter, but now you're basically referring to quantities that are mathematical, which given certain axioms are always true. Yes. And then about knowledge, which depends on perspective. Yeah. So those are two different things. 
but I need this knowledge in order to make sense of the mathematics, to, to understand I mean, the axioms, for example. Mm -hmm. the bear, yeah, but that, but that is, but you're talking about different things, like that you need knowledge, sure, but that doesn't mean that knowledge has anything to do with axioms. I mean, I'm not sure I follow. So that you need knowledge is, well, sure, you may want it, let's say, but that does not mean that knowledge is entropy. I mean, entropy is a mathematical quantity. Yeah. And that mathematical quantity does not uh, does not refer to code, does not refer to how we understand the world. And in fact, one of the greatest things that Shannon's theorem do, which are about, this, about entropy in a different sense, is that it does not depend on how you represent it. Entropy is a physical quantity, and whatever state you have, how you understand it doesn't matter. Yes, if, so if we define it through the ma ma microstates, or if we define it through the heat, like yeah. that's okay. like, like Clausius did when he invented Entropy, right? Okay. So there, that's that's. I think that's that's the, the important thing that there is not one way, one perfect, one right way to define entropy. That entropy is a concept that, depending on 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 the direction you come from, has a different shape. I mean, if it has a different, I mean, if you mean that it may have different meanings, then well, sure. But then we're not talking about the same thing. Then the the entropy that talks about, I still don't see how it has anything to do with knowledge. When, when Clausius uh, invented the idea of entropy, he didn't talk about knowledge yet. But to yeah. the connection through Boltzmann, when he, he took the microstates into, in, into account, there you can start talking about knowledge. And if you know about it in... No, no, I mean, wait, wait, but I mean, what, uh, wh why, like, so knowledge of a certain microstate, that's something you may be able to talk about, but that has nothing to do with what we talk about knowledge in the sense of human understanding of the world. And it's just more abstract, right? Knowledge, I mean, Is it? We, we, um, we, kind of, we kind of go into the realm of information theory here, now, right? Well, Ent entropy is a very, very central thing of information theory. Sure, yeah. And the way entropy is defined in information theory is completely different to how entropy is defined in classical thermodynamics is completely different well, to no, how no, entropy is I mean, defined in statistics thermodynamics. Sure, but not, I mean, well, if you take Jane's work, then stated in Shannon's entropy is pretty much the same as the Boltzmann one. Yes, for for a certain for a certain for a certain boundary condition, which we assume, and that's that's I think the point that the entropy is not a real thing. Okay, it's um, just a concept. Which, which is true under certain boundary conditions, which we assume as sure. correct, the thing, okay. given of the, of the perspective we have. Sure, but then if it's not the same concept, if it's not the same thing when we're talking about human knowledge or when we're talking about uh, physical entropy, then where's the connection? Well, it is the same thing. It's just from a different perspective. And if it's... it's the, I mean, no, I mean, uh, one thing is a physical reality, the other is a mathematical concept, right? And those are not only perspectives, but rather um, fundamentally differently defined things. I mean, like no knowledge is one thing, it's an abstraction. And talking about knowledge is an abstraction of an abstraction. But, but so is physics. Physics is also abstract. Sure, um, and everything that we can talk about is an abstraction. That doesn't mean that that's the same thing in the sense no. of when I talk so why would those two abstractions be the same? I mean, why would, why would one say that understanding the world increases entropy rather than decreases it? Like when you do machine learning and you do cases like, uh, basically when you do a good model of the world, you need less bits to represent it. Yeah. Now, does this mean that I'm decreasing the entropy or increasing it? I don't know. That's exactly my point. Like why, why would knowledge of the world, why would a better representation why would we say that that increases entropy as opposed to decreases? But just one uh, minor uh, thing here. So actually nobody in the paper ever talked about knowledge. It was only about information and density. So the whole point was, and this was basically illustrated with the example of having new ideas. And like here doesn't equal knowledge to my knowledge. Um, so it was just about the center packing or um, condensation of having more mental space, if you will. 
increasing the length of stay didn't mean that the increased knowledge was more about um, having more ideas, having more um, exchange, and more um, yeah cross um, correlations um, correlations across time. But actually, nobody in the paper ever talked about knowledge per se. Um, that's also another thing. That if you take a system and you increase its correlations, it usually you decrease its entropy. Take a system and increase its correlations. You have to run on variables and make them correlate. And say I'm gonna bias it so that those don't scale. The entropy is lower. Yeah. So increasing correlation does does not necessarily. No, it's, I think it's about the base rate here. It's not about the correlation. It's about what? Uh, the base rate. That by by ex extending this mental mental space, you mm -hmm. generate uh, new idea, new ideas way more frequently. Compared so to, for example, the known whatever rate, for example, DNA mutation or other kind of um, biological um, dynamics um, that are way slower. And for us humans, it's then actually DNA mutations if we want to compare it with anything. Okay. And if we compare it with this, then we actually increase the space rate. And with this, we actually then um, have this effect on the timing um, that the there is a higher rate in less time. It's not a correlation per se that is then higher or lower. It's a higher frequency rate, you can say. Okay. For example, you can take um, the biomass on Earth. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. for example, I don't know. Before humans were on Earth, there were I don't know 100 percent animals. Yeah, without being whatever species. And then on top now we have 96% um, divided um, yeah, animals divided into humans and domesticated animals and only 4% wild animals. Where does the chip come from? From the human species. Mm -hmm. And um, this, for example, would then could be one um, outcome of this high uh, change rate and that not, no other species actually ever achieved. Um, no, uh, that I'm, I, I, that you're in particular I mean, I, I sort of see, see more or less what you mean by the rate, but I'm lost with the animals. And, I mean, where, where does the entropy come into this thing about the animals? I mean, yeah, I think I see what the rates, or this rate of ideas production. I mean, I would not definitely call this entropy, but. I think the point wasn't really on the entropy or the change in entropy, it was more on the, um, let's say, the if, if we consider we are in a nuclear stable state, with the same entropy uh, as the state, yeah. um, the change rate, or the, yeah, basically the change rate, how to um, influence the nuclear stability to go up or down, there we are somehow quicker or um, we increase this, um, or we shorten the time that this nuclear stability can either go up or down, basically. The fluctuation. Yes. Basically, how, how fast, how, how the, yeah, the, the, the rate of the fluctuation. We increase dr dramatically, like 10 to the power 5 is the number that we give, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we increase this, we increase the speed of this process. We basically, humanity increases evolutionary rate. And what? What makes and what then the question is, what does that I mean, then do to the state? Evolutionary rate defined as? Um, evolutionary rate defined as new, so in this paper defined as new ideas okay. evolving in the mental space compared to DNA mutations on a pure biological level. Okay. And with this, then the question is, and it's open, it's not, the, it's not the solved in the. We need more history. humans in the end? More. Uh, well, I mean, you, no. you want to increase the number of ideas, and what you're telling me is about the rate at which they're But is that, no, but is that the goal? That's just the question. Is that the well, goal? Well, that's, I mean, that's well, precisely the point, right? That you're trying to say that we need to have more ideas and more rates, yeah. and the natural solution for that would be to have more humans. I no. didn't say we no, need to have need, more ideas. We don't need that. 
I think the thing is, we already have a huge amount of ideas, but we just need to um, maybe funnel them into different topics, for example, okay. and one of the topics could be the whole problem, because this is actually a substantial problem. No, no, it is a substantial problem, sure. but then that's not the same as the entropy, right? Because before the entropy was about straight ideas, not about... Yeah, well, I mean, look at this picture. What happens through the through the rate, uh, through the fact that the rate is accelerated, is that we, we get <coughs> faster to the boundaries and faster to new channels. So the, the, the speed of going from bubble to bubble increases dramatically. And what we can do now, because it's not only as opposed to evolution based on randomness, but we can steer it in a certain direction. We can choose if we go in this bubble or that, or that. So the, the, the take home message is not to make more, make more, become more people, become more ideas, but to channel them in a direction that we rather end up here than there. Kind and of. the entropy is a given, that this will increase, that's a given. So we would always, so for example here, it, it is, it is uh, illustrated in time, um, which would then also correlate with Entropy. So it's not a question of whether do we actually increase entropy or not, it would anyway increase. But the question is which path does it take? Which channel do we take? Which and which that yeah. the thing is for the planet and for the universe, again it doesn't matter. I mean, I'm, happy, I'm happy that we don't burn down the earth like everyone is, but I'm just not sure what does the entropy Not yeah. necessarily something. Well, basically, the, the, it, we're not saying that the entropy is guiding us to the right direction. Basically, the take-home message <laughs> is that life, as opposed to Schrodinger's cat, seems to be an entropic behavior process. Because even though there's a high level of, of order, especially on the DNA level, the fact that the DNA is kind of time, uh, it, how do you say it? Yeah, it's kind of time independent, kind of. There are fluctuations, but they are very slow compared to our, our lifetime. Um, that, that tends to get cancer. <laughs> but um, that this, um, this metastability of DNA is actually entropically favored because it makes, it, 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 it is a, the basis for a generation of a lot of entropy through life. Basically, what, what this, how I, I boil this down, how I boiled it down certainly when, when I first read it was, well, basically what this paper is telling us is that we're all very efficient yeast machines. So our, our goal, our, our, why we are here based on the second law of thermodynamics is to generate heat, but not only heat, heat as a surrogate for entropy. There are, of course, other, other terms of entropy. And wouldn't you say a nuclear explosion increase the entropy more? Yes. Yeah, that's the point. When we just let, let the universe do what it what it will, we will collapse. Okay, so the then so more entropy is not a good thing. Not necessarily. Entropy is neither good nor exactly. bad. That's that exactly. Entropy yeah. is just the stability is what you would think. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Entropy is just the, the path it follows anyway. Yeah. But we have the chance to say if we go this way or that way. I mean towards higher entropy. entropy. I mean human agency on the face of the world that's certainly something that that is important. Uh, I'm not sure why. I mean, at the moment, we, we would like to keep the, the, the same state that it is now. So we would unlikely ourselves would favor stability. And so that stability, mm -hmm. maybe the entropy is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah. then there's a problem because we cannot be um, connected to the universe, or we're not. So we cannot just say, ah, yeah, we want stability. Let's not have any increase in entropy. But it would follow anyway. So the question is then how to 